There is an oasis hidden within Masese, Uganda. It may be hard to find on a map, but if you trace the Nile down south, you can find Masese just to the east banks. This is affectionately known as the source of the Nile. Tucked away to the east of Lake Victoria is Masese, a refugee village of 25,000. Danita is the most central district of Masese and is home to Help International Primary School, a center of hope for the young minds who attend. Their future is looking bright and they have come a long way from the hardships of Uganda's past. I consider the people of Great Britain are my best friend. My action, if you are actually uh, to see and check it carefully, you will find this is not against Britain at all. Uh, it is only transferring the economy to the hands of Ugandans. And, I am, and even in Britain, the whole economy, it has been controlled by Britain except there are very many Jews who are also controlling your economy in Britain. I think you know this. And as well as in the United States of America, the whole economy there is controlled by Jews. administration in those shops is run by the Ugandans. Would you like to get all Asians out, really? Yes, they must go to their country. Even what? nationals of Uganda? If they want to go, uh, they, are, they, are, they, are, they, are, they are welcome to go. What will happen to these people if they don't go by the time they I think they will be sitting like they are sitting on the fire. I will tell you this. You just wait after three months. What will you do to them? Okay, you will see. <laughs> <laughs> when is the war in that period, people could run to go anywhere where they could save their life. And most of them, they, they came here to Masese. There is a complex political history in Uganda. From European colonization to warlords and political dictators, such as Idi Amin and Joseph Kony. Amin launched a reign of terror which displaced hundreds of thousands of Ugandans. While Joseph Kony started the Lord's Resistance Army, or the LRA, in northern Uganda. After years of committing atrocities and fostering child soldiers, Kony was forced out of Uganda, causing many to seek refuge. They have no food, they have no closings, and now they could go to the factories there, and the, the factory it is not easy to get the job. It was not easy to get the job. And when you get the job, they are underpaid. Somebody is working for, uh, for the full day and is being given 1,000 shillings Uganda currency. That is almost... Uh, how many cents see the US dollars? That's 33 cents. It's 30 cents. Somebody must pay the house. Somebody must get food. Somebody must get health uh, medicine. Uh, is, that is, and there are about 10 members in a family. And let me tell you what I have seen. Sometimes when there is war in Africa, uh, again, people produce a lot. They gave, uh, they, you can find somebody is having about 12 children and he has no earning that is earning. And when he's earning, he's getting little. 
that thing causes other people to go and take marijuana to go and steal at night they go and steal and sometimes they are also killed when they are gone there they are security people they are bulleted they are doing what because they are thieves so that was the problems and it is congested You realize that most of us in Uganda, we come from poor families, we struggle growing up, we struggle going to school, we struggle feeding, we struggle dressing. So by the time you grow up, you've gone through lots of experience. And I'm not any different. I grew up in the same situation, struggling to survive, struggling to go to school. So when I finished school, uh, I realized that uh, I needed to give back to the community because I was also supported by people. So I said I'll give back to the community to help these kids become better people. Because my sister has had a lot of challenges, poverty, witchcraft, drinking, lots of things. There are three different hubs in Masese, known as Masese 1, 2, and 3 respectively. Each has their own distinct characteristics. Masese 1 has a condensed population and overlooks Lake Victoria. Masese 3 is more on the developing side and there is a stark contrast of poverty from here between Masese 1 and 2. Masese 2, or Danita, is the central hub of the area, with a bustling downtown, so to speak, and is also the location of Help International Primary School. Oh, Masese. Masese has really changed. It is not the way it was 10 years back, 20 years. We had a number of children on the streets, but now at least they are getting education. They are no longer on the streets. The former chairman of Masese made great strides to push Masese forward. During his 30 years as chairman, he has seen how far Masese has come and what it was like before the school. Yeah, government. I think uh, electricity came up to this point here. The whole of this place here was non-electrified. Eh? And this place here was uh, the factory where they were making uh, the houses for this uh, project, the Masese Women project. Eh? It was uh, a Danish uh, grant uh, given to the ladies in this area here. Eh? A low income, a low, a low cost loan. Eh? Uh, so that the people could have affordable housing. Eh? Around uh, 2002, by 2002 when uh, HELP uh, came in, uh, the production had stopped and uh, this place here was uh, bushy, eh? actually dangerous spot eh? because uh, uh, when you, you could come here in the mornings you could find uh, residues of the drugs that the kids were using during the night. Actually, if you could pass here at night, eh, you could easily be uh, harmed. Eh? So, uh, when uh, uh, a young man called Mutumba, Stephen, eh, came and uh, met the youth in the area, most of them were uneducated, unemployed, and of course, uh, by then, uh, when, we left, when we left town, our I just dropped out of college eh? because of illness. Eh? I got a bit of uh, adult onset of polio. So when we came here, just a few of us were educated. Eh? So he came and talked to the young men and told them that uh, if you could come up with a, a project, eh, I could link you to some friends of mine and we, they could probably empower you to do something for yourselves. 
the school came because there were so many children in the streets and they, they weren't going to school. And it was really evident that if we were going to break this chain of poverty, we had to do it with education. There wasn't another way. But I want to I wanna tell you a story. So the night before I went to Uganda, I was in Kenya, and I had a dream. And in that dream, it was like a snippet, like just a snippet, like here are all these African children, like a sea of African children, and they are saying, yes, Miss Jean, yes, Miss Jean. I thought that was such a strange thing to have happen because when we hold medical clinics, people don't know my name. I mean, they're plenty glad to come and tell me their story, but they don't, they don't know who I am. So the next day, I go to Uganda, I fly into Entebbe, we drive to where the school is going to be, where the school today is, and I'm sitting meeting with men that have been in the vocational training program. And I am talking about business principles and business training. And I say to the man next to me, and what, how are you trained? What are you trained to do? And he said, I'm a teacher. And before I could, before I could suck it back into my mouth, I was saying, so what if I pay you to teach all the children? that are sitting on the sides of the streets. And he said, oh, I can do that. I can do that. Ben, the first teacher of HELP International Primary School, originally thought there would only be 25 students in his class. But after seeing how much of a need there was for education, the school began to reach new heights. When the school began, we didn't have furniture, we didn't have blackboard, we didn't have school uniform, there was no toilet. In our community, that is Masese, we have kids that are not doing well. Um, much as the community is set up of people who are not doing well, but they are those that are in much need as compared to the others. And then so we started with 45 kids and within a short time <laughs> the numbers were jumping, eh? you know, that was in uh, 2000, 2008 I think. Eh? So Ben together with uh, Madame Lydia um, uh, and uh, Billy Ofonya eh? were the teachers, eh? yeah there were three and it started from the elemental stage, eh? nursery level. Eh? Uh, for me, I came from Northern, and in our area in Northern, few people went to school. So, and I lost my parents when I was very young. In wars, I lost my parents. So, I really had the time to go back school, to go back in school, before Elep taken me. Take before Elep, Elep to take me to school. I had uh, had the time to go back to school. So it's like. Uh, the reason why I like teaching, I know there are some children out there like me eh, who also have those challenges. They have no parents. Some has maybe parents, but parents has no money. Some parents doesn't value education. So if I'm a teacher, I know through teaching, I may touch the life of some child out there. And maybe that child also may be like me because I was also lifted up by hell. So if I'm a teacher, one day, one time, at a certain point, I may also leave some child out there. Help promote children's right. And when you find many children who, who grow up from here, when they go in secondary, at least I've been seeing, I've been following their life. It's not like those other children. Eh? You see a child who have right, that you see them valuing themselves. You just know this child has what? Rights. 
That's why I'm proud of working with help. Their heart is centered towards children. They want the children to be lifted up. So I think help is dealing with the children who are the young generation. By the time they grow up, this community will be changed through education. What is going on in Masasi didn't happen through a big corporate office. It didn't happen through lots of money. It happened through just a few people who got a vision to help in an area they didn't even know. Going to Uganda ex exposed a lot of need. I mean, it, the need was overwhelming. It was difficult because it's overwhelming. What am I going to do with all this poverty, all this need? How can I make a difference? How can I help? Well, I once read a story. I can't remember where I found this story or, or who wrote it or anything, but I found this story called um, The Starfish Story. And in The Starfish Story, uh, there was a mother and her, her child, her little boy, was walking along the beach. And the night before, that tide had brought in, uh, had washed in thousands and thousands of starfish. And they were drying out on the shore and dying. And the little boy was frantically running along and throwing back starfish, throwing them in, back into the water. And his mother looked at the expanse of, of the number of starfish that was there and said, honey, you might as well give up. You can't make a difference here. There's too many. And he said, he reached down and picked up a starfish threw this starfish back, and he said, it made a difference to that one, Mom. And that was profound for me, because I could make a difference to that one. For instance, when I bought this necklace, I made a difference in that life of the woman that made this necklace. When I go sell this necklace to somebody, that money will make a difference to a child in Uganda. There are ways to make a difference, and each one of those starfish is precious. over the last eight years. We now have 500 children at our school. We start with three-year-old nursery and we go through seventh grade. We had never anticipated bringing in three and four-year-olds, but we very quickly realized that when the children stopped nursing, the lack of food came in very quickly. So the children were beginning to experience malnutrition. But by bringing them into our school earlier, we not only took care of that health situation, because at this point we're able to give all of our children two meals a day, breakfast mm -hmm. and lunch, but the three and four year olds are beginning to learn English. So over the 10 years, it has been a tremendous growth. We've seen three graduating classes so far who have left us in seventh grade and have gone to high school. We're very proud to say that last year, 100% of our students passed the country exam and moved on to high school. And through sponsorships and scholarship programs, we've been able to fund those children to continue their education. We also have the sponsorship program where we, have some of our children have individual sponsors. And at this point, I would like to say that all children at Helipi International are sponsored, all of them. I sponsor a child at Helipi International. She's now in senior one. 
I started supporting her in P6, and uh, it was one of the ways of giving back. I may not be making a lot of money, but I think I make enough to support someone. So I, there's a child I picked up who was struggling. She's a girl. She was struggling with fees. They would chase her every day, feeding fees. 15,000, they would chase her every day. And then I said that now, why can't I support this girl? So I took her on. I support her with scholastic materials. I support her with upkeep. I support her with uh, dressing. I support her with her school fees. She's now in secondary school, and thank God we have a bursary scheme at help, but it's not enough for kids, so I always stop up to ensure that she goes to school. And I made a commitment to her that I'm going to support her through school. Would you mind telling us how you came to meet Daisy and adopt her? Daisy, I'm going to Kati bade ngezo kuchima yange kati na mama we na labi mama we agenze kati nange na chimo mwana oyo na tansi kupera na yepa mwagenda kusomero nga okunona anodi kunona notice notice mm. na yenga mama wa daisy kaze mwana mm. mkwata kumkona mkoma wo mm. kati mama we agenze ndala ndala she had gone to school to collect her kid from school because by then he was still in kindergarten so when she had gone to collect her kid from school uh, Daisy's mother had not come to pick her, but she was crying from school. So she felt touched and brought her to her home. And since then, she's been, Daisy's been living with her? Yes, ever since then, she's with her. I was curious if you could tell a story about one of the children who you took in. It was the friends who introduced him to me, that he was living a miserable life, he was staying outside, staying in the bush. Mm -hmm. From there I could come here in school. Mm -hmm. They came to me, they said, Bonnie, what? Do you know what? No. Emmanuel is staying outside. He's sleeping from outside. He has no where to go. The mom got some problem and the mom was imprisoned. I said, Emmanuel, what's wrong? What am I hearing? Is it true that you are staying, you are staying outside? The, moon, the, ma, the boy was like, ah, it's the truth. I said, why? I'm staying, I'm staying alone. Come and join me. We could stay together. Is it true that your parent is in prison? The boy started crying and I was so sad. I said, no, it's okay. Starting from day onwards, you are going nowhere. You are staying with me in my home. He was reminding me of the way when I was on the streets because I suffered. So I didn't want him to suffer anymore. Because for me, I didn't, I don't, even up now, I don't want to see any child suffering. I could use any penny I have on my pocket to help out that child who is suffering. I don't want. When you walk into help, you are tempted to think that we are just a school because you'll see kids running around, everything happening around children. But uh, we are much more bigger than just the school, although the school is our biggest project. But uh, we have a lot of other projects. Uh, our school, we have around 550 children in primary and close to 100 in secondary school that we support as well. Uh, then we also have the vocational institutes. We have three so far. We have the tailoring school where we bring in single mothers to train them with tailoring skills and support some of them start up businesses to sustain their families. We also have the ICT where we train people on how to use computer. You realize that Danida as a community was lagging behind in terms of technology. So we said we are going to bring this project closer to the people and ensure that they acquire computer skills. Then we also have the automotive classes. We call it motor vehicle and mechanics where we bring young people to learn how to repair cars as well as drive them. So that is the other vocational side that we have. And then we also have uh, projects like Dacoponics. Uh, it's a new concept in Uganda where we rear fish but also grow plants. It's an ecosystem where the two feed on each other. Good 
This is what we call aquaponics. We have fish here. These are fish tanks. And uh, this one is called the deep water culture. We abbreviate it as the DWC. Uh, it's for water storage. And it also it is also a place where we plant vegetables and also where ammonia that affects the fish and it's produced from the fish tank that may affect it it is detoxified so this system does very many things it detoxifies ammonia at the same time uh, the fish uh, the, the the plants grow in this place they consume that ammonia and in the process of consuming that ammonia they are detoxifying the ammonia from killing the fish when we look at sustainable agriculture you know for us here in africa it is a custom like every person wants to do something uh, related to agriculture so this community because this is something new that very many people have never seen even me, it was my first time, because when they told me to come and join uh, the expert, I was hearing about aquaponics. I had to go to the internet to know what aquaponic means and what am I going to do there. So it was a new experience. This is the same thing to other people outside here in Masese. People are surprised. How can fish survive in these small tanks? And how can we grow? put plants on, uh, on these uh, rafts, on these floating things, and they survive. So they were really excited, and some of us were asking us that, eh, how? How can it be? I mean, they were asking for the price, if they could also make it. Yeah. So what I can say is that it attracted many people. There are many organizations, for instance, we have community organizations like uh, Laon Development Association, these are from the north, then we have other associations. Eh? Now, these are kind of people who are, uh, uh, they, they, they have joined their hands, they have their organizations, they have some projects running. Uh, some of them are planning to put up these projects. They say that it can sustain life because here we have one good season in Uganda. Let me say in Africa. So, that is three months and you grow your vegetables, you eat, then forget. Then you wait again for the next season. The rain is not very good in the second season. So you try to grow something to eat, but you lack food to eat. But then they see that this project is throughout. Now looking at the future, like the future, it has created more wisdom to many farmers how they can improve on their agriculture in the future. Because right now we are facing very many disasters in the world and people want to have something of this kind. Uh, when we look at what we call uh, urban development, you'll find everywhere are very many houses and people do not have land. Uh, like the, the local method of farming, someone should have a very big portion of land to grow something. But with this kind of modern farming, someone can even have an aquaponics in his small compound where he has built his house. Maybe it is just um, a plot of 50 by 100 and he builds his house somewhere and some space he can put an aquaponics. So it has developed the mind of people uh, to believe that uh, I can do more better in agriculture though I am in town because this has been a problem people thought that it is only uh, agriculture is only done in the villages but not in town as time goes on people of Uganda people of Masese people of this place will resort to this system as you continue educating them through practical things like this because when you talk theory no one understands theory but when people see it practically they'll say, okay, I think I can try it. We had, we had a good harvest today. So today we harvested this and they're going to take it to the kitchen. 
and they are going to cook it for the staff. It's beautiful. When I was 14, I came to Masese too. I was living on my own, so I didn't have anywhere to stay. So a friend of mine brought me here to stay with him. Well, as I helped him to work in a video hall, the help has changed this community. Because most of our kids have not been going to school, but they have now got that opportunity of going to school, getting, being fed well, not any other like any other school around. So, and I, as I'm also interested in helping these kids, that's why for me, I, never, I don't even care about being paid. That's why I volunteered. Once I was on the streets, I grew up on the streets. So I didn't have that love for, from the parents. But I don't know how it came to me that I love kids much, 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 even up to now. I don't know. Maybe it's from God, but I just love kids. A feeding program came into being because most of these kids here, wherever they come from, eh, uh, their, their families are, in, uh, are poor and uh, at most they can afford probably a meal a day. So when they come to school here, probably their last meal was uh, supper. Or, uh, supper. They are hungry and they can't learn when they are hungry. Eh? So a suggestion was made, how about if we start something like a feeding program eh? to give these kids something to eat uh, so that their attention span is uh, lengthened. Eh? So we started the feeding program and then the kitchen was built. In most cases, what keeps children in school when they eat something, when they, the teachers are there and they are treated well, there is nothing that will make them run away. And here, I find most of the services, food is available, breakfast is available. There are many things that come in to make these children keep at school. Yeah. We know that our kids love working with computers, and I see that when they, uh, I see that in the way they react when you tell them they're going to go to the computer room, they're very excited. So we just know they want to work with the computers. So we, what we do is we exploit that enthusiasm. Yeah, we exploit it, and uh, when they come here, they want to work with the computers. But we tell, we tell them how to use the computers. We tell them if you want to use the computers, then you must do what is on the computer. We want every child to be on a computer so that we can analyze and help these children better. So the more computers that come in, the more these children are given the opportunity to work with the computers. And then the other thing, it's not about them learning to use the computer. It's empowering them to live better in the modern, uh, in the modern world. I feel so proud to be a part of the change that is happening in Masese. Um, I, like I told you, I have relatives in Jinja and in Masese specifically. We used to come to Masese for holidays and all we knew about this area is that that's where the garbage from the entire Jinja was, was dumped. So we all thought that this is a place where garbage is dumped and there's nothing good that comes from this side. And I didn't even imagine I would be here. But I feel so proud that there is a lot happening here, and it's because of what this project is doing, and I'm proud to be a part of it. Yeah. 
in the whole Uganda, at least the name of uh, Elp is known basically on sports. So we when so when we speak about in terms of sports, we are not known in community Honde, but uh, other districts we are known and in community here they really know that here we're teaching and not only academics but also we teach children how they will sustain themselves tomorrow yeah uh, on the donation of uniforms first of all i want to thank her those who have donated uniform to us it really separates us and it brings unities among the players even uh, it brings unities in the communities so we really we thank for those who are giving us the donation of uniform and may God bless them so much. I guess the first trip there, um, one, we had no idea what to expect, or for that matter, what we could do to help. Um, we had absolutely no idea, and um, we made the decision to, uh, because of our, our background in, in volunteering with uh, Little Theater in our hometown, um, we decided to put together a, a week-long, basically a drama camp um, for the kids at the school. The thing that um, that we were the most surprised at um, was kind of the, the intro before we did the plays was um, just doing more of like just pretending. But when they were, when they had the costumes on and they were doing their, you know, pretending that we were, were so like surprised and like saddened by that they they didn't really know how to pretend. Everything is new to them, but they are trying their best. I'm just happy now they have changed their attitude. Now they go there. At first I used to run after them, but now they are used. They go there, they have also started loving the musical, loving what they do. And also, like, I need to thank the people who thought of it and brought all this for these kids to learn. and. They, like, he identified the talents of these kids could be they are gifted in there whereby they can earn a living for themselves. Or even, like when you know some core curricular activities, it is easier for you to come on board than when you are dull. You know, music makes you eh, fresh all the time. So this competition, I may hope for the best I may not hope for the best, but I know there is some good work being done. And I pray if we make it to the best, well and good. If we don't make it, for me, I'm still strong. We are not going to lose hope. And I just pray that even when the music festivals are done, the children keep on being trained. That he, when we have visitors like you've come, when we have parents come here, they could do, these children could do show something that they are gifted. A couple of women around 40 were making beads. Uh, they created like it was a group, drama group, and I was part of it. We could dance, we could sing, make drama. So one day we thought of how we could make a living, I mean how we could earn out of this. Not only dancing to entertain our community, but how could we earn from it. So one of the members called Betty Kambulu said she had been trained to make craft through papers. She introduced that idea to us and most of the women were welcoming so we started slowly by slowly rolling papers she was training us some of the women also had been trained from different places how to roll papers how to make but we didn't have market so we thought that since we were mothers 
of kids that go to school if we were to introduce it to the whites that were in this school that is Help International. Yes, we introduced the idea to them and they were welcoming. The papers that they used to throw away turned into a source of income. School is primarily funded through the sale of jewelry. We discovered uh, after two years into the project, some of the mothers of the children who come to our school were making beautiful jewelry made from paper, like what I have on. And we were buying it from those little group of moms to bring home and give us gifts. And people here in the United States suggested, because they thought the jewelry was beautiful and well-made, why not do this as a fundraiser? So that's how we first started with that. So we expanded the amount of jewelry that we purchase. We purchase it directly from the mothers and that allows them to feed their children, pay their rent. And then we bring it back here in our suitcases, we sell it here. And now we're at the point where the operating budget of the school is covered from jewelry sales. So we went from a very small group of about 15 women. Those 15 women have in turn trained other women on the art of making jewelry from paper. And now we have close to 90 women who we provide a market for and we've provided a life for at this point. Uh, these women now have an opportunity for financial independence. Understand, in these economies, men aren't always around. That there are many men that uh, are gone and these women are left. The women are the primary household um, uh, leaders of the household or their grandmothers. <coughs> They are the ones responsible for making sure the kids are dressed, get to school on time. They now have a way through the beads, through the jewelry, of being able to provide for their families and for us to be able to now sell all of those over here and we return all that revenue back to fund the school. It's an amazing win-win situation, both for the women and for our kids and for the faculty to manage and operate the school. There are women that have constructed houses through bid making. They are always testifying that I have a husband, but he has not been able to raise money for us to own a small house. But through the, bid, the bids that I sell to Help International, I was able to make money, I was able to raise funds, and now we have a plot, and from a plot, they have constructed a small house, so they are no longer renting. Help has helped the women of this, like the name is, Help has helped women, not only women, but families, own houses. Uh, we also have the microfinance. It's a new project that I think started one year ago. Oh, slightly above here, but uh, we believe that this is the real deal for community transformation because we are trying to empower people economically. Now, you realize that in Uganda we do not have enough jobs to accommodate everyone. So, now if you don't have enough jobs, then the way forward is to try and create opportunities for them to work. We call it self employment here. Now, what we do, we try to, we are starting with our parents because we are trying to train them to make, do business and then support their families. For a lot of microfinance, it gets a bad rap, especially in, de in developing nations, because there's for-profit microfinance and there's non-profit microfinance. So a lot of banks in the area will do for-profit microfinance where they give interest rates that are 100, 200, 300%. The interest rate, as Chris was saying, is so high that it makes it almost impossible for people to pay this off and therefore they default on their loans with no opportunity then to get another loan, that's it. So um, here we are, a village looking for opportunity and we started with the model and most of the loans that we started off with were for around $50, 50 American dollars. We provided some small business training we helped them in terms of writing a proposal. We did not give them money without a proposal. 
so that they understood that there were certain responsibilities that they had, that they would be accountable for the use of this money. It gives them real independence. There's not, okay, here's $100 and now we walk away. No, we're not walking away. We put together in our model the fact that there's a team over there that is responsible for this, that works with us. Microfinance has been a very good thing to these women. Most of them have come up. They have, they begin paying. Like the last time, some women have not had, could not pay fees for their children. But right now, at least they can pay something for their children. And even their children at least can get some food, some things to eat, like water and some clothes. Success is significant here because we are working with them. And they understand that this is a loan, that they are accountable for paying it back. What I love about HELP, and specifically our microfinance project, is that it really teaches us to empathize with people in a developing country and understand that $50 can dramatically change a person's life if it's handled correctly. Now, for example, one of the women who got one of our loans in our first round, Alan, we gave her around a $50 loan and she wanted to start a produce stand. So when we first visited her, her produce stand maybe had one sack of charcoal and tomatoes and a couple avocados, and that's about it. So after her $50 loan, she paid back every single week. She was always doing her savings plan. And she ended up within just one year, she was able to grow her business to where when we looked into her home, which is where her business operates out of, from floor to ceiling, there was a whole entire stack of charcoal bags. And then on top of charcoal, she was able to start selling potatoes. She had lettuce. She starts selling silverfish. And it's just amazing how we just kind of helped her get out of this little hole she was in. And all on her own, through her own ingenuity, she was able to take $50 and dramatically change the way that she's living and her business. And another woman who we gave a loan to is Caroline, and she is a seamstress. And when we gave her first loan, I think it was around $70, she wanted to take denim and make jeans. So within a year, she was able to buy or rent her own kiosk in Danita, which is right outside of the school, and it's much closer to her home. And she's able to produce as well as sell her clothes at the same time in this kiosk. And within that same year, she was able to move from her home made out of mud to a brick home. And she's able to have extra income for her family in order to buy clothes and extra food. And it's just remarkable how from a little amount of money, they're able to create such wonderful businesses. I'm proud because I'm what I am because of Help International. Who could see Bonnie right now? I was not born of 2018. I lived a miserable life. But because of Help International, I give them a credit. That's why I'm always happy to work with Help International. And I still will work with Help International until I don't feel like even leaving Help International. Yes, it's all in my heart. I say it, it's all in my heart, Help International. I like it. I've been associated with HELP ever since 2002, and I've seen how it has evolved from uh, a small organization to something very big, you know? I mean, sometimes I... I when I look around, I just see... Uh, see possibilities eh? because this is an organization that is still growing eh? I mean if you look at uh, the kind of people who are employed at first by help international and the people we are bringing in right now eh? I mean it's amazing we started with a uh, uh, volunteers who are uneducated and now we are having people who are having ideas bringing more on board I mean 
I think the sky is the limit for this organization. I didn't even imagine I would be here. But I feel so proud that there is a lot happening here and it's because of what this project is doing and I'm proud to be a part of it. I mean, before we came here this side, there was no, there was no power this side, there's no electricity. Now there's power. There, there's a lot of business happening this side. Uh, we've seen, we see more, uh, hard, more construction going on and because of the project, we see the government paying more attention to this area because there's activity going on. One thing I like from help that will never go away from my memory is they've stood with me. Yes, in many areas, different times, even when things go worse, there are people that I call and they come to my rescue. If it wasn't help, maybe I would have not been a teacher. I could be maybe somebody, maybe a border, border rider somewhere else. So I believe help has improved my life. And through working here as a volunteer until I became a teacher, it has changed me a lot. I would like to thank God for my life, for passing me through a hard experience growing up as a young person and for turning this experience into a positive one to help people who go through my situation. Secondly, I would like to thank him for the opportunity he gave me to serve the community of Masese. There is an oasis within Masese. Though it is not the kind you expect, Help International is the oasis for the next generation of Uganda. Help International Primary School started with 50 students 10 years ago. Today there are over 500. I want to be a doctor if I finish my studies. I want to be a footballer. I want to become a nurse. I want to become a lawyer. Whenever the rains, all collects here. In 2019, Help International broke ground on the construction for their new school building. The school will be finished in 2020. I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who has made this project possible. This project is not one person. It's many people that have come together to help another in another country far away. So as you look and see what this project has done, know that it's many people doing many things and those things come together to make a huge project successful. Thank you for helping the people of Masesei.